All right, so obviously this is where we begin our study of the kingdom protista. And why now? Well, we just finished looking at the structure and function of the eukaryotic cell, and protists were the first eukaryotes. They're, in general, they're single-celled organisms that are eukaryotic, as opposed to bacteria, which are single-celled organisms that are prokaryotic. The thing that's weird about the kingdom protista is that it really shouldn't be a kingdom because the members of the kingdom protista are not necessarily related to each other by common ancestry. They're what we refer to as polyphyletic, meaning they have multiple uh, ancestors instead of just one common ancestor. They are eukaryotic, however, and that's one thing that they all share, but they share that characteristic with the other kingdoms, fungi, animalia, and plantae. Um, but the combination two characteristics that identify most prokaryotes is that they are unicellular eukaryotes, um, whereas fungi are mostly multicellular and all animals and plants are multicellular. So to confuse things more uh, in the kingdom protista, they can be either unicellular, and most of them are, but they can. some of them are also colonial, um, which is uh, a number of cells that are living together, very similar cells living together, not very uh, highly specialized cells. There may be a couple specialized cells, but not, not many at all. Uh, and that's kind of the... Um, definition of multicellular is uh, a multicellular organism it has a handful at least of specialized cells carrying out specialized functions for the organism. Um, so some protists are multicellular. Some of the algaes are considered truly multicellular. So there are three groups of protists and they're not classification groups. It's very important that you understand that. There are the plant-like protists that we commonly refer to as algae, which are photoautotrophic. So in other words, they're the photosynthetic protists. They have chlorophyll and they're able to uh, capture the sun's energy and, and use carbon dioxide and water to make sugar. Um, that's what all photoautotrophs do. But they're single-celled, uh, colonial, and multicellular. Um, and they're classified in the kingdom protistas mostly because they don't fit in the in the kingdom plantae. And so of the of the organisms that I have here, the ones that are plant-like protists are this one, which is colonial. Um, the whole this this whole big sphere here is made up of little itsy bitsy cells that are all very similar to each other. And then these smaller spheres on the inside are daughter colonies that are. Uh, forming, which is a, a form of uh, asexual reproduction to produce new daughter colonies on the inside of the parent colony. But that's a photoautotroph. And by the way, you can tell because it's green, because it has chlorophyll. This is a photoautotroph, 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 and this is another colonial one. These are unicellular photoautotrophs, and then this is another colonial one, but it's a different kind of colony because the cells are in chains. Um, so we would refer to that as filamentous. The, the cells are in, they form filaments. And then this is uh, photoautotrophic. And you'll notice that this one kind of looks like uh, uh, an animal-like protist. Um, that's what we're looking at in the lab, if you'll recall. Uh, and they, they have flagella, so they swim around. So they kind of look like animals, but they have chlorophyll, they have chloroplasts, they're able to photosynthesize, so they're actually photoautotrophic. We also have fungus-like protists that are referred to as slime molds and water molds. And again, it's not a classification level within the kingdom protista. It's not like a phylum or anything. Um, it's just a common way of referring to those organisms in the kingdom protista that are fungus-like. They are absorptive chemoheterotrophs. <clears throat> so if you'll recall, animals like us are chemoheterotrophs, and fungi are chemoheterotrophs, and they're also, a true fungi are, are absorptive chemoheterotrophs, just like these fungus-like protists, and that's what makes these protists fungus-like. <clears throat> 
both true fungi and the fungus-like protists are absorptive heterotrophs. Absorptive because they digest things outside the cells and then absorb the nutrients into the cells. And the one representative of the images that we have here is, is this one. These are the fungus-like chemoheterotrophs. This is a slime mold, um, and it's being grown in a petri dish on, on auger, you know, just like you can grow bacteria in a petri dish on auger. But um, when you look at these, I'm going to be getting some of these in for the lab, and when you see them, you'll see why they call them slime molds, because they, they kind of just slime around. And then finally, we have the plant-like, or I'm sorry, the animal-like protists, which are commonly known as protozoa. And again, that's what we're looking at in the lab right now, are just the protozoa. Zoa referring to animal. Um, but again, this is not a classification level. This is not like the phylum protozoa or anything. It's just a common group grouping of the protists um, based on the fact that they are animal-like. So they don't have chloroplast to photosynthesize, and they are not absorptive heter uh, chemoheterotrophs. They are ingestive chemoheterotrophs. In other words, they engulf food and bring it in and digest it inside the cells instead of digesting it outside the cells and then and absorbing the nutrients. That's what the fungus-like protists do and true fungi do. And we are ingestive chemoheterotrophs also. We eat our food. We bring it into our bodies and digest it within our bodies. So the ones that are left here are the ones that are animal-like protists, protozoa. So here's a protozoan, and here's a protozoan, and here's a protozoan, um, protozoan. And I didn't use P for protozoan because uh, I didn't want it to be confused with the plant-like protists. So these are animal-like protists, the protozoa. And the protozoa get around in a variety of ways, uh, and that's how they're classified. They're classified by their mode of locomotion, and you'll see that in a couple slides from now. Okay, so where did eukaryotes and protists come from? Well, based on fossil evidence, because we can find microfossils of protists in the rocks, they appeared on Earth about 2 billion years ago, and that's a very rough approximation, 2 billion years ago. But bacteria were the only things on the planet for 2 billion years before that. So you can kind of divide uh, Earth's history into two, two uh, time periods where for 2 billion years there was nothing but prokaryotes, and then eukaryotes evolved about 2 billion years ago, and that takes up most of the, uh, well, it takes up 4 billion years of the 4.8 or so billion years of the Earth has been in existence. Um, so this coincides with the evolution of eukaryotic cells. So in other words, protists were the first eukaryotes. This diagram represents the evolution of eukaryotic cells from prokaryotic cells. So where did eukaryotic cells come from? They came from prokaryotic cells. This is the theory of endosymbiosis, which is a theory that we have investigated before. You should be familiar with it. And I just had realized that I had an L in here, so I, I just deleted it. Um, so I'm going to explain now this theory. But again, we've looked at it before, so hopefully you're somewhat familiar with it. And this will just kind of jog your memory. So this is a prokaryote, and it's, it's anaerobic, which means it can't survive oxygen. And that's what most, if not all, prokaryotes were back before oxygen was available in the environment. In the, in the oceans or in the atmosphere. And it wasn't until photoautotrophs evolved, photoautotrophic prokaryotes, in other words, cyanobacteria-like organisms evolved, they started photosynthesizing and adding oxygen to the atmosphere. So this is representing time passing and an increase in dissolved oxygen in the oceans. If you'll recall, back when we were studying the Earth and life through time, the oxygen that was produced built up in the oceans first and dissolved in the oceans first until the oceans were saturated with the oxygen um, and, and all the iron got done combining with, all, with the oxygen. Then it started being released into the atmosphere. But this is all in water. Um, so dissolved oxygen is what we're concerned with here. So when oxygen started being uh, introduced into the, the oceans, those anaerobic prokaryotes had a problem. Um, and this is representing the infolding of the plasma membrane to form some of the uh, membranous organelles that you just learned about uh, 
that make up eukaryotic cells. Uh, so the, the uh, nuclear envelope around the nucleus and the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi, those are all part of the endomembrane system, and they all uh, are thought to have originated from infolding of the plasma membrane because they're all made of, of uh, membrane. They're all made of phospholipids, the phospholipid bilayer, if you'll recall. <clears throat> so the idea here is that that more complex prokaryote, more advanced prokaryote, uh, engulfed some aerobic heterotrophic prokaryotes that had, had evolved to be able to handle the oxygen that was building up in the oceans. So this was a gradual buildup of oxygen and, and species, some species were able to evolve to adapt to that. And so that's what these aerobic heterotrophic prokaryotes represent. Um, and they became, but they, they were engulfed, but they weren't digested, they weren't eaten by this advanced prokaryote, they were kept around. And it was found that that, what was an anaerobic advanced prokaryote was able to survive the addition of oxygen in the oceans because it had this endosymbiont living inside it that, that could handle the oxygen for it. Um, and not only that, it was the way that it handled the oxygen was to produce energy through the process of aerobic cellular respiration, which is the function of uh, mitochondria today. So the idea is that these endosymbionts eventually evolve to be a part of the cell and reproduce along with the cell and be passed on from cell to cell and became what we now know as mitochondria within eukaryotic cells. And that would represent uh, that the evolution of that cell represents the very first protozoans, which went on to give rise to fungi and animalia. You know, the animal-like protists have common ancestry with both fungi and animalia because they're heterotrophic. Now, if we back up, um, you, you may recall that this involves serial endosymbiosis off on this branch. So we, we first have the endosymbiosis that explains the origin of mitochondria. And then we have an, a branch off uh, that also engulfed cyanobacteria-like cells to become endosymbionts and those became chloroplasts. So here we have the, the progenitor um, or the common ancestor of all photo, uh, eukaryotic photoautotrophic organisms, beginning with algae. So this would be the first algae, which are protists in the kingdom. We, we now you know, classify in the kingdom protista, but that's probably gonna change. But anyway, um, and algae gave rise to the kingdom plantae. So, Photoautotrophic eukaryotes are on this branch, and it took two endosymbiotic events in order for them to have chloroplasts. So the result of this is that mitochondria have common ancestry with aerobic chemoheterotrophic prokaryotes. In other words, this guy, the aerobic heterotrophic prokaryote. And chloroplasts have common ancestry with photoautotrophic photo prokaryotes like that are similar to cyanobacteria. What evidence supports this theory? You know, without a time machine, there's no way we can go back and see that this actually happened. But there are characteristics of mitochondria and chloroplasts that tell us that this is probably what happened. They're about the same size and shape as bacterial cells, as prokaryotic cells. Their membranes, they, they both have a double membrane. If you'll recall, when we were looking at the structure of mitochondria, they have an inner membrane and an outer membrane. So do chloroplasts. And the idea is that the outer membrane may have originated as the membrane uh, that surrounded the cyanobacteria, for example, that was engulfed here. Um, from So it's the plasma membrane became the outer membrane of the cyanobacteria and chloroplasts. Same for the mitochondria. Replication. Both these organelles replicate by binary fission within, the, within their eukaryotic cells, within eukaryotic cells, just like bacteria do, just like prokaryotes do. They both have ribosomes inside them, not on the surface of them, not outside them, but inside them. They have their own ribosomes, and they have their own DNA. And that's probably the most uh, significant 
of the characteristics that suggest that they were once free living organisms. They have their own DNA. So in your cells, not all of your DNA is in your nucleus. Some of your DNA is in your mitochondria. And they have just this little ring of DNA similar to the bacterial chromosome or bacterial plasmid. So there's a lot of evidence to support the idea that both mitochondria and chloroplasts were once free living prokaryotes. So here we're looking at just the animal-like protists, and as I mentioned, they are classified by their structure for locomotion, their mode of locomotion. And you can kind of tell that there are a number of ways to get around for these protozoans from these diagrams. So the phylum ciliophora use cilia, which are short hair-like structures that they use to swim. So these are those short hair-like structures. So this is these two represent phylum ciliophora. And you might recognize them as uh, paramecium and stentor from, from the lab. Then there are protozoans uh, that use flagella as their mode of locomotion, which are longer than cilia. They have the same ultrastructure. In other words, they're both made up of microtubules. Both flagella and cilia are made up of microtubules in the same arrangement. It's just that flagella are much longer and less numerous. So that's really the difference between cilia and flagella. Flagella are longer and less numerous. So these are in the phylum zoomastigna, which are flagellated protists. They're also known as zooflagellates, but that's not a phylum name. They're just commonly known as zooflagellates because they have flagella. Then we have the phylum sarcodina, which use pseudopodia, false feet, which are temporary extensions of the plasma membrane to get around. Um, so they kind of just blob from one place to another. And, and so these are the representatives of the phylum sarcodina, all three of these. Uh, some have evolved so that their, their pseudopodia are what we call actinopods, um, and they kind of stick out from a shell. So they have a shell, a silica shell around them, and the actinopods stick out through holes in the shell. And again, you're looking at this in the lab. You're looking at amoeba in the lab. Uh, this is a, a, an amoeba, a sarcodyne, that forms a shell around itself made of little particles um, that it puts together. And then we have the phylum sporozoa. And the sporozoans are classified not by their mode of locomotion, but by their lack of a mode of locomotion. And they're all parasites. So it makes sense, you know, parasites really don't need to move. The, they move through the environment, or you could even say the environment moves them. Um, so they're passed from person to person. For example, this is the pathogen that causes malaria, Plasmodium falciparum. And if you know anything about malaria, it's passed from person to person by mosquitoes. That's what we call a vector. The mosquito is the vector that carries malaria from one person to another. Um, so these things don't have to move on their own. They're carried by mosquitoes from person to person. Once they're in a person, they're carried through the bloodstream until they uh, get to where they need to go in your body and, and get to the blood cells eventually and infect your red blood cells and uh, destroy them. So sporozoans have neither cilia or flagella or pseudopodia, and they're all parasites or pathogens. So this diagram represents the phylum sporozoa. We're going to be looking at the phylum ciliophora as an example of a lot of different ways that protozoans go about their uh, carrying out their life functions. Um, and this is paramecium. That's our representative which has cilia, ciliates, all ciliates have cilia. Their entire, the entire cell is not necessarily covered with cilia though. In paramecium it is, but in other ciliates, it can be just around one part of the cell instead of around the entire cell. But re recall the cilia, these numerous short hair-like microtubule structures. So if you look on the inside of cilia, you'll see that they're made of, of microtubules in a particular arrangement. And we'll be looking at that, that arrangement coming up. But they function in locomotion, so in other words they allow the paramecium to swim, and you'll see that in the lab when you look at the living paramecium. They're, they're swimming all over the place. And they also use them for feeding. They, they set up feeding currents around their oral groove. They'll beat the cilia and that'll set up uh, kind of like a whirlpool 
that will bring in food particles into the oral groove so that they can engulf them by phagocytosis. So that's what we're going to look at here in detail is how they go about their feeding because a lot of the structures that are labeled here in the diagram have to do with uh, feeding. So the cilia, like I said, sweep food particles into the oral groove. The particles get swept down to the end of the oral groove that's referred to as the gullet. And then phagocytosis takes place in the gullet to form food vacuoles. If you'll recall, phagocytosis is a form of endocytosis where the plasma membrane engulfs a food particle and surrounds that food particle, forming a vacuole. And remember, vacuoles are for storage. Um, but in this case, it's, it's relatively temporary storage because lysosomes will fuse with the food vacuoles. So all these little dots it's labeled here in the diagram. All these little white dots throughout the entire cytoplasm of this paramecium are lysosomes, and they will fuse with the food vacuoles and form what we call secondary lysosomes, and those are the food vacuoles with enzymes and acids that came from the lysosomes, uh, and digestion is taking place inside the, those food vacuoles uh, that are now sec considered secondary lysosomes. So the food will be digested in the food vacuoles, and the food vacuoles can circulate around within the cytoplasm and release nutrients. The nutrients will diffuse out of the food vacuoles as they circulate through the cyto cytoplasm and release those nutrients into the cytosol, the liquid uh, aqueous solution portion of the cytoplasm. Eventually, though, all the nutrients will, uh, all the nutrients that can be uh, obtained through digestion will be gone and the food vacuole will fuse here at a region of the plasma membrane known as the anal pore and release the, the non-digestible waste out of the anal pore through exocytosis, the opposite of endocytosis, right? So here in the gullet, we have endocytosis, more specifically phagocytosis, cell eating going on to form food vacuoles, and then eventually after digestion has taken place, what's left over has to be eliminated as waste, and that happens by exocytosis at the anal pore. You'll notice that there are two nuclei here. There's a macronucleus, which is responsible for the day-to-day -day function. So just like your, your nucleus only has, uh, your cells only have one nucleus, and that nucleus is functioning from day-to-day -to, -day to carry out all the processes or, or uh, allow for all the processes that your specialized cells are, are carrying out. But these guys also have a micronucleus, and that's a, a general characteristic of ciliates is that they tend to be multinucleated. So in the case of paramecia, there are two, but in the case of other ciliates, there can be a whole string of nuclei, um, so they're highly multinucleated. But the micronucleus is a, kind of like a backup copy. You can think of it as like a backup drive, you know, like on, on a computer where files are stored that you don't want to lose, backup copies. Um, so there's, it's a pristine copy of all the chromosomes, but those chromosomes are not used for anything, therefore they don't get damaged, they don't, they don't accumulate mutations. Whereas in the ma macronucleus, it can, they can, the uh, genes can accumulate mutations, and eventually the paramecium can become sickly. And that's when it has to conjugate with another paramecium and exchange copies of the micronucleus, because the micronucleus is pristine, are pristine, undamaged, unmutated copies of the, of the genome, of the chromosomes. That's what is uh, copied and exchanged, replicated and exchanged between two paramecia during the process of conjugation. And that will kind of revive them, you know, they, they won't be sickly anymore, um, and a new macronucleus will be made from the micronucleus. That's what happens following conjugation. So paramecium is an example of a freshwater protozoan, and there are a lot of protozo protozoans that live in, in freshwater. Freshwater meaning not salt water, not the ocean, not the marine environment. Um, and freshwater is hypotonic compared to the cytosol inside the cell, which would be hypertonic, right? And if you'll recall those terms uh, relating to osmosis, water is going to osmose from hypotonic to hypertonic. So in other words, water is going to, by the process of osmosis, diffuse into the cell 
and produce pressure inside the cell, osmotic pressure, which might lyse the cell. If you recall, that means break open. And so that process of a cell breaking open because of the buildup of osmotic pressure inside is known as cytolysis or cytolysis. That's what needs to be avoided here. So the cell has these contractile vacuoles, which are specialized vacuoles, and we, were, we looked at them in, uh, previously because they are organelles that you find inside uh, eukaryotic cells. They collect the water and swell and then contract. That's why they're called contractile vacuoles. And when they contract, that pumps the water through a pore in the plasma membrane and, and pumps the water out of the cell. They're kind of like sump pumps. They take in the water, the excess water that's inside the cell and pump it out of the cell so the cell doesn't undergo cytolysis. Very important function. And so that function is known as osmoregulation, regulating the, uh, uh, the amount of water in the organism osmoregulation, which is the same thing that your kidneys do, or it's one of the functions of your kidneys anyway. Your kidneys carry out many more functions than just osmoregulation, but um, so the, the contractile vacuoles are kind of like a primitive analog to the mammalian kidney or the human kidney. Finally, because it's labeled in the diagram, I want you to, to know what uh, these trichocysts are. Trichocysts are mostly for defense. They're like harpoons, little harpoons that shoot out from the plasma membrane if a predator comes along and tries to eat the paramecium, and it will deter predation. It will, it'll, it will uh, defend the paramecium against being eaten. Um, another function is in anchoring. Sometimes the paramecium will use its trichocysts to anchor itself in, uh, in a feeding position, for example to stay in one place to be able to set up food currents and, and feed if it finds a good good source of food. But otherwise, they're a defensive mechanism. They come shooting out from under the, the plasma membrane, um, and they make the paramecium look even more hairy. Uh, for example, the, the preserved specimens that you're looking at in the lab, probably a lot of the hairiness that you're seeing on the paramecia are the trichocysts that have fired because in the process of preserving the organism on the slide, they freaked out and shot out their trichocysts uh, trying to defend themselves.